Those of you who grew up playing Battlefront 2 will surely remember the TX-130 fighter tank, one of the Republic's most versatile armored units. In Battlefront, the TX-130 essentially served as the Republic equivalent to the Separatist armored assault tank. In a recent video, we called the AAT one of the best repulse lift tanks in galactic history. So what about the TX-130? Does it rank up near the AAT? Was it really as good as we remember it being from Battlefront, or was the game's portrayal inaccurate? We're going to be answering all these questions today as we take a look at the tank in detail. Attention, Sergeant on deck! The TX-130 Sabre class fighter tank was a product of Rothana Heavy Engineering made for the Grand Army of the Republic at the request of the Kaminoans. It was designed to be used by Jedi Generals as a sort of command tank, much as Separatist commanders tended to use the AAT, and as a result, it was initially produced in fairly small numbers. After the tank proved itself extremely effective at the start of the Clone Wars, however, production of the TX-130 was dramatically ramped up and it started seeing use in more diverse roles on battlefields across the galaxy. The TX-130 was actually quite small. In fact, it was so small that it wasn't even classified as a tank, but rather as a speeder. Its branding as a fighter tank, however, was a much more accurate labeling of its role. Essentially, the tank was designed to be the Jedi Starfighter of the ground, a fast, maneuverable craft that could nonetheless hit hard and serve as a versatile command post. The engineers at Rathana really just wanted everything you could possibly want in a military vehicle crammed into one package, and somehow, they managed to pull it off. Rathana ended up designing one of the most insanely compact speeder tanks in galactic history. Held aloft by a comprehensive network of repulsor lifts, the TX-130 was fast, with a top speed of 320 kilometers per hour. For a repulsor lift tank, that's absolutely incredible. To contrast, the AAT had a top speed of only 55 kilometers per hour, and the ground armored tank, the Confederacy's equivalent to the TX-130, could only reach 130 kilometers per hour. As far as speed and maneuverability were concerned, this tank really was just a starfighter that couldn't fly all that high. Accordingly, the TX-130 featured a very flat design, intended to be as aerodynamic as possible. The tank's cabin was located at the back so that the armored frame of the craft could slope up to its height gently, for example. Speaking of the cabin, it was rather cramped. It was barely high enough for clones to be able to stand upright in. However, it nonetheless managed to have room for the tank's pilot, a co-pilot, a gunner, two passengers, and even an astromech, though all of them at once would have been a hell of a tight squeeze. This cabin was accessible via a large door at the back of the tank. Two clone pilots operated the TX-130, one that served as the primary pilot and another who served as the co-pilot and navigator. The tank featured a pair of small windows for these pilots to make use of in the event that the tank's instruments were ever damaged, which could be sealed up with armored plates to prevent enemy snipers from taking advantage of them. Additionally, the tank also had a position for a gunner, who could use a hatch on the top of the craft to access a small dorsal turret. Not all TX-130s employed gunners, however, and some didn't even bother with co-pilots either. For example, Jedi who piloted these tanks on the battlefield usually did so alone. The realities of making such a compact vehicle with such a high speed meant that the TX-130 was rather lightly armored. This was likely another factor in its formal classification as a speeder rather than a tank. Its armor was light enough that any real tank would probably be able to blow the TX-130 away with a single shot, especially if it aimed for the cabin door at the back of the craft, a notable weak point. To account for this, the engineers at Rathana actually managed to work a pair of onboard ExoShell 3 deflector shield projectors into the craft's design. These shield generators allowed the TX-130 to soak up a lot more damage than its armor could alone, and this, in turn, allowed the craft to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with real tanks on the battlefield. Of course, this only worked to a degree. Even with the shields, the TX-130 was still quite fragile for a tank and couldn't count on being able to soak up too much damage. The TX-130's main weapons were a pair of heavy laser cannons which were mounted on outrigger arms on either side of the craft. These cannons weren't fixed and could turn on both the vertical and horizontal axes, though only to a degree. 
They had a high rate of fire and a respectable damage output. They weren't nearly as powerful as the main cannon of the AAT, but they could nonetheless do plenty of damage in their own right due to their high rate of fire. The TX-130 took only a few shots to destroy the average light armored vehicle, and it could deliver those shots in the same amount of time the AAT took to fire off just one round from its primary cannon. Additionally, most TX-130 models had some sort of dorsal turret. The stock model featured twin medium laser cannons, while other TX-130 variants featured powerful beam cannon turrets. Both were intended for anti-personnel use, and both were effective enough at that role. The TX-130 also featured a pair of onboard missile launchers, which were variable payload and could carry 10 rockets each. This was quite the ordnance load for such a small tank, and it gave the TX-130 incredible destructive potential. With the right rockets, these fighter tanks could take down much larger targets with ease, all while moving at almost unfairly fast speeds. All told, the TX-130 fighter tank was a hell of a war machine, and we can only assume that it was approximately expensive as a result. It's no small wonder that it was initially produced in such small lines then. But the Republic clearly found the credits to buy a whole lot of them anyway, and we can't say we blame them. These tanks were positively insane, and while we'd still say that the armored assault tank was overall a better repulse tank, this craft is definitely up there in the rankings. While it may not have been exactly what we remember from Battlefront, it was nonetheless about as good. As with many other GAR vehicles, the TX-130 made its battlefield debut in the first Battle of Geonosis. Jedi generals made use of the tanks as personal command vehicles during the opening and closing stages of the battle, with Mace Windu and Luminara Onduli being the most notable TX-130 pilots on Geonosis. Shortly before the assault on the Petronaki Arena at the start of the battle, they leaped into the cockpits of the TX-130s to rapidly neutralize anti-aircraft guns, allowing the Republic assault ships to descend into the lower atmosphere. As the battle came to a close, Windu once more hopped into a TX-130 to pursue Count Dooku, though he was prevented from catching up with the Count by a trio of Dark Acolytes. The most notable use of the TX-130 was during the Dark Reaper Crisis in the first months of the Clone Wars. In that campaign, fighter tanks began to see use by clone crews as well as by Jedi, and they proved to be excellent anti-armor units. On Rax's Prime, Renvar, and Thule, TX-130 tanks proved to be the Republic's saving grace, ultimately allowing the GAR to stop Count Dooku's Dark Reaper before he unleashed it on the galaxy. As we mentioned in a recent video on that superweapon, the TX-130 was especially crucial for Republic forces in the Battle of Thule. The Dark Reaper itself was ultimately destroyed by a TX-130 piloted by Anakin Skywalker. After the Dark Reaper Crisis, the TX-130 became one of the Grand Army's more common ground vehicles. It wasn't quite as common as the ATTE or ATRT, likely due to the cost or manufacturing issues, but it did see its fair share of use, especially during the Outer Rim Sieges. The Sieges saw the TX-130's anti-armor capabilities employed to their fullest, as Jedi generals routinely sent squadrons of fighter tanks out to clear away Separatist tank columns. TX-130s notably participated in the grueling siege of Seleucami. All told, the TX-130 fighter tank was a beast of a war machine. It may not have been as resilient as most tanks or as heavy hitting as some of its counterparts, but it wasn't really supposed to be. It was, after all, a fighter tank, focused more on speed than armor, and in that category it excelled. No other tank in the entire Star Wars universe was even remotely as fast as the TX-130. And it still packed enough of a punch to blow the likes of the GAT and AAT away on most battlefields. This war machine really was the Jedi Starfighter of the ground, and the engineers at Rathana who designed it were absolute geniuses. So that's our look at the TX-130, the Republic's oft-forgotten fighter tank. But what do you think? Do you have fond memories of this craft from Battlefront? Feel free to post your thoughts in the comments below. And just before you run off to the next suggested video guys, make sure you check out some of our links in the description below, including our new channel called The Braved. We go all through history to check out some of the most badass individuals of all different eras. And if you're more into music, we also have our Relax Jack music channel, where we use a lot of the music posted there on the videos posted here. And also, if you do want to get access to a behind the scenes Discord server where you can chat to myself and the team who makes these videos, as well as some exclusive content on the actual Patreon, make sure you consider donating there. 
And if you just want to join our wider community, check us out on our Geetsleys Gaming Network and our Geetsleys Discord. Anyways, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.